people are acting with fear all the time and changing the institutions on everybody. So um, good, healthy, mentally well men uh, are really a key component to you know a good society. I mean, we're one of the biggest challenges on society, so why don't we fix that? Today's sponsor of the Eternal Optimist podcast, an amazing gift for busy professionals, for event facilitators, rock stars, and marathon runners. Have you ever had to use the restroom right in the middle of an important business meeting or a phone call or even a date? You have to stand up and go to the bathroom for a minute or a few and break up that momentum you had in that moment where you left things on hold. We have a solution for you today. A diaper for men, man purrs. They come in different colors for those who want to feel stylish, different absorbency levels for those with a really strong flow. Order today and get a free clear man purr, which looks just like whatever it is you're wearing on the outside at that time. So you can comfortably go at any time you want and no one will even know the difference. And for those who don't want to wait, get man purrs right now. Wait one second. What about ladies? Are you feeling left out? We also have woman purrs available. Order the next two hours and get the free scent guard. So if you do, number two, it don't smell like poo. Today's sponsor of the Eternal Optimist Podcast. Hello again, friends, and welcome to the Eternal Optimist Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Drinkon, and I'm here for you. I invite you to be curious and open to today's conversation. And anytime you listen to this podcast, because it is truly here for you. I am here for you. We are all here for you. What does that mean? That means openness, curiosity, humility. Play these cards as often as you can, because when you do, you'll find the universe is a plenty of opportunities are out there for us. It's abundant with opportunities. We have to learn how to play offense through the lenses of curiosity, openness, humility. These are positions of strength, not weakness, when you play them from a place of strength inside. And that's what we're all about, is to help you overcome challenges and provide hope that you can do it too. No matter what stage you're at in your life, the top of the pyramid or at the rock bottom, no matter where you are in your life right now, we play offense for you, with you, my friends. Before we go any start, further and get started, I want to encourage you, you can connect with me on social media. Follow me on Instagram or Facebook at Eternal Optimist Podcast. I also do a live stream uh, at 7 a.m. Eastern, Monday through Saturday, on Instagram and Facebook at these accounts. I would also invite you to rate and review, subscribe, but really rate and review and forward this podcast to other people. Because if you don't know the podcast game, it's all about the ratings and reviews. I would love to get a five-star rating or, and a review. And if you feel that it's something less than five stars, I'm still open to that too, friends. Rate it, review it, and send me some message. I'm open to your feedback and appreciate every single one of you listens and watches. Without any further ado, let's dive into today's episode. Friends, every moment can change your life. These are the words of today's guest, Mike Skripnek. Now, I want to give you a disclaimer and warn you in advance. Today's episode is not for the faint of heart. It's not for children. Uh, we are going to share some very challenging very personal, tough things that Mike has endured and overcome in his life. Get ready for Pandora's box to be open today, my friends. It's a masterclass in courage in how to open up and let go of personal trauma from a man who held it inside for nearly 40 years. Have you ever felt the heaviness of a secret festering inside of you that was subconsciously controlling you? You might connect with this challenge or you might not even be aware of it, its influence over you. Well, today, Mike Skripnik shares all the reasons that he didn't want to talk about and open up about his trauma of sexual abuse by a trusted leader, how he came to the awareness that this was holding him back, how he almost ended his life because of the weight of this secret. His story is one of rebirth from trauma into impact and the ways he found support, overcame his own self-talk, and took the steps to get help and get back to playing offense in life. Mike is all about empowering men to have strong mental health. This episode is for men who want to break through trauma and enhance their thinking. It's also great for women who desire a deeper understanding of how and why men keep things to themselves. How does one overcome the paralyzing feelings that follow from trauma? Here's a man today who opened up and shares because he wanted growth, he wanted relief, and ultimately he wanted to impact. And he shares how 
through all those things, he's found it. You know, I cried in this conversation because Mike is so real, so transparent. He models how to move forward through the head stuff, the hard stuff. Friends, welcome to courage. Welcome to bravery. Welcome to humility, aka welcome to my conversation with a man worth meeting, Mr. Mike Scripneck. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to the Eternal Optimist Podcast, the show for optimists by optimists. This is the show for people who see the good in the world and want to make a positive difference in the lives of their families and communities. Each week, you'll hear inspiring stories that will get you thinking bigger and playing more offense in life. With your host and high performance coach, Matt Drinkon. And with that introduction, I am proud and excited to introduce you to my new friend, Mike Scripneck. Mike, welcome to the show, my friend. Oh, Matt, thanks so much for having me here today. It's uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Absolutely. I, I felt an instant connection, which is why when we were talking to get started, uh, I just felt really easy talking to you. You know, I think one of the things that made me feel that way is I look in your background and I see that there's a little, little holiday decoration back there. You've got the word joy back there oh, and yeah. just your, your, your whole body language, everything was very inviting to get started. So I'm looking forward to diving deep and talking about uh, challenges and lessons learned and exciting things you're putting into the world. So let's start with chapter one, uh, challenges. And if you could take us back in time, Mike, anywhere from, let's just say earlier today to childhood, and let's just look at a couple of things in your world that have been hard for you and, and dissect and, and share whatever you're comfortable sharing, please. <laughs> That's a Pandora's box. Uh, well, <laughs> Pandora, let's open it, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, open it up. Uh, well, uh, it's it's lately and in the last year and a bit, um, uh, there has been no question uh, uh, about my candor in terms of some of the challenges I faced in life. Uh, and that's on the back of what anyone externally looking in would would look at and perceive to be a pretty fantastic experience. Like I've had a lot of incredible successes. I have an incredible family. Um, I've had incredible friends throughout my life and, and just opportunities that some people don't get and experiences that you can tell tall tales with and that are just memorable. And, and so when you look at that, you go, well, that's great. How could there be much that wasn't, how could, is there a dark side? Is there something underbelly to it? And the interesting thing is along the way, I didn't really feel there was much, as much negative as uh, maybe there was. And it's mm -hmm. to say it in that way, um, I think there's some timely, you know, things in the news these days. And, and it's really around the fact that no one would have ever uh, suspected that last September of 2021, um, I decided that for 10 days that um, the pros and cons of killing myself was something worth spending time considering. And mm -hmm. you consider dark days and hard times, um, you know, I can't really pinpoint one particular thing, but a culmination of in what I would view as insurmountable pressure in life at the time. Um, seemed to push me and a, and a couple small things pushed me right over to the edge, but this is not like something I'd experienced in my life before I had spent 20 years at one point, um, in the financial services industry. So you can imagine you're at the whim of the ebbs and tides. And I was originally from Calgary, Alberta. So we also had the energy sector ebbs and tides. So you always had a cyclical business and a cyclical nature of the stock market. So no matter what, there were going to be challenging times. Um, mm -hmm. and and I've had big deals blow apart and small deals and something really small just kind of fell apart and I just felt hopeless. And whatever it was um, with the pandemic, uh, that was 18 months in, the isolation and everything seemed to accumulate into this moment and throw me into this descent where I just looked at the river that was raging near my house where I would walk every day and I thought that would be a good place for my carcass. <laughs> You know, and I speak with this in, in, with humor. I, I look back at it because I think it's laughable now, but I, uh, the gravity of it is immense and it was very dark. 
And uh, when I consider where I was, um, you know, I needed to dig out. And I was in this one moment where I just couldn't do that to my family. I couldn't, you know, restart their lives based on my inability to cope with my trauma. Um, mm. I was actually afraid I'd fail. <laughs> Can you believe it? Mm. I was considering ending my life and I was afraid I might fail at that. And at that point, I couldn't bear feeling like a failure at that as well as everything I felt hopeless about at the time. And so I just, I reached out and I started to get help. And one of the biggest support uh, efforts uh, was uh, one of my friends who she just, you know, yanked me up and said, you've got to, you got to step forward, not um, keep wallowing in. And and but I had to deal with some things that got me in that spot, and that determ- determination to never be in that horrible moment um, really was my next inspiration to find out what was going on. And mm. and I uncovered some things that I knew all along, but that were really pretty much all that dictated my life for forty years. <sighs> wow. Well, first uh, pause and uh, thank you for your candor and transparency, Mike. Uh, Appreciate it. Uh, it's challenging to hear because, like any other successful person, it's not just all unicorns and rainbow. And man, he's doing great over there. You know, there's real hard stuff because once you achieve a certain level of success, there might be some expectation to maintain or to continue more, more, more. And you, um, you had some stuff that you had to deal with, and it was heavy. And just thank you for sharing. And um, mm-hmm. to the level that we may, I'd love to to ask you know what you did uncover, uh, and how yeah. you've, uh, progressed in, in dealing with it so far, Mike. Well, I, th- I think the one thing in, in that, Matt, is that I was fine. Like I, you know, though you talked about reaching heights and having successes. I mean, I had, by that time I'd written five books, six, uh, eight books. And, you know, I've had a, a illustrious career in, in different things and I've had lots of successes. And, and so, you tend to convince yourself, <clears throat> um, having never really dealt with things, um, that somehow you're okay. And this is, I'll talk about this later in the conversation, I'm sure. And this is something that I'm really um, a staunch advocate of now, and that is about this disclosure. And, and so at 11 and a half, I was sexually abused. And so there's this elephant in the room in my life. And forever I live with that. You know, for my teen years, no recollection, blocked out. And then in my adult years, it seemed to be there every single day. And, you know, it's subtle. You, you, you see something in the news, someone's abused, you know, it's always, yeah, that was me as well. And it's always present. However, you're not conscious of the, of the damage that was done to your psyche at the moment of trauma, how you responded to that extremely negative situation, that life-threatening, you know, that at least my mind perceived. Um, at that moment, it may very well have been, who knows? And so you live a life going on going, well, yeah, that's in my past, but I, I'm clearly, I survived and I'm a, I'm a success. So, (laughs) you know, I'm a success story. Maybe someday I'll talk about it, but I never wanted to, and I never did. And so what you end up doing is living with a secret that's festering in you that no one knows. And every time there's a moment, um, you know, of negativity in your life, you, that starts to rise up a bit because no one knows, no one understands and you don't want to share and you don't want to say, but you don't understand. This is what really is going on with me. And because for fear that your, you, you know, your career will be at risk. Some will view you as uh, weak. Uh, you know, just there's a myriad of reasons why men are not disclosing. And I wasn't any different. And so here we are, thir- you know, 30 years after I started to th- think about it and 40 years after the incident, um, the, the secret decided today's the day it's time to try to kill Mike, (laughs) you know, kill me, kill the body, kill the organism or make him deal with it. And so I decided to deal with it. And I saw it, um, first of all, disclosure and sharing and love and comfort in my family. Um, and they were amazing. Uh, so one check one, uh, all the risks you perceive about sharing your, these horrific things about your life with the people who love you, um, you know, the fear you had at the beginning, (laughs) completely useless fear. Uh, they love me more and they accepted me more and they were more empathetic than I could ever understand. And so 
Step one, uh, that risk was uh, poorly perceived on my part. Step two, um, treatment is going to be really crazy and I'll have to confess all my sins. And I don't know how I'm possibly ever going to go through some therapy because there's a, it's, it's, cra- it's, it's unknown to me. Yeah. Um, reached out, found the right person and um, started therapy and treatment was simple. It was straightforward. It was something that I could easily get my head around and didn't hurt. I didn't have to confess every sin I've ever done. <laughs> you know, I wasn't stepping in. I had to deal with the trauma, with the issue, with the one thing, right? And we did that. And it was extraordinarily effective. Um, and then the next was beginning to live with that and knowing that comfortably I'll be fine and sh- beginning to share. And you don't have to share with everybody. I, I chose to begin to do that because I I was compelled by how incredibly effective my treatment was. And in that process, um, suddenly your energy shifts and everything's better. And it's not the same journey for everyone. I know there's a duration effect to how trauma affects people. And, you know, it's, it's not an overnight miracle, but for me, it was nearly, it felt like that. Mm. And and so where I, la- I launched from is as if I just was able to reset an entire life, not that nothing in between was important because it really was critical, but I could take that optimistic, young, loving, trusting kid at 11 and kind of get this emotional time travel to, you know, my 51 and a half year old self. And it, it was almost like beginning again. Um, and, and just like I mentioned earlier that podcasting is a joy, isn't it? It's fun. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And the people we get to meet and occasionally from time to time, we just go, oh my gosh, that was one of the best conversations. I can't believe that person agreed to join me on this show. Right. Like exactly. you get that moment. Mm-hmm. And I spent a lifetime pushing. It was the pillar of the community that pushed me away. And he was the charismatic leading person, head of the church, head of the clubs, head of the choir, head of, you know, everything. And he was the charismatic leader, the ex army air force veteran decorated pilot world war two, who, um, was the abuser of all the boys, um, that were around at the time for a couple of generations. And this man who everyone trusted was the person who was betraying their trust. So one of the deepest hardwiring subconscious things of my life has was at the, after that moment, and I didn't, I was never aware of this was that you can't trust good men. Mm. And when we talk about where we are today as podcasters or anywhere in life, and we think about the quality of humans that we're able to attract to whatever it is that we're doing, And sometimes we scratch our heads and wonder, holy cow, I can't believe I'm in the same room or the same conversation. It's so amazing. Mm -hmm. Throughout my life, professional career, I never got to have that experience. Um, What would happen is I would pick and select working with flawed men. And the good men somehow I repelled, I kept out of the room. I don't know, it was just an energy. And for, for years and years and years, I was just not, sure if I could ever stop repeating this pattern of being close to a flawed man when it hits the fan and things go wrong and I have to take business loss, move on or whatever, right? I, you know, I always had to restart. I go to the end of he, of this treatment process and suddenly I have this energy that changes. You even talked about it. You said the joy is, you know, the way you have experienced me already in just the few minutes that we've spent together. Um, is a, is a way that no one has, no one ever experienced me prior to a year, um, the years prior to last year, say at this time, Mm. because this is when my healing journey kind of, I was done in a way, in part of it. And that is amazing to me. (laughs) First of all, it's unbelievable. Um, but where the people I'm, I'm, that come into my life, the energy that's out there, the relaxed um, nature of how I am today versus any other time in my life prior, uh, before I was 11 and a half years old, uh, mm-hmm. until uh, before I was 11 and a half, um, was really cool. never like this. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't something that you could just see and say, oh yeah, that guy, I, you know, something about him. Like, there was always something. 
but it wasn't obvious. I mean, I was gregarious. I'm a friendly guy and lots of people that I like and, you know, I'm social with, but Mm -hmm. it's next level different now than it has ever been. Mm. And it's, you know, I have all kinds of ways of explaining it, but it's, it's just, it's just a different, it's profoundly different today than it was, you know, before that moment of healing. Well, it feels like from the very moment that uh, that we connected, I could just feel that it's easy for me to speak with you. It's easy to be around you. You're you're inviting, you make others feel comfortable being around you. And uh, it saddens me to hear that not everyone got to experience that before 50. uh, Because it's, it's, this is, it's really easy. It's already impactful to be around you now. You know, and I, and I wonder uh, now, I know that you're involved and you lead a group men worth Call, tell me what this is, men worth meeting and that's right you, you are with other men and you can you talk a little bit about this group and kind of your vision your purpose behind it because in my experience in only a few minutes now uh you're worth meeting and being around you is actually uplifting me so <laughs> talk a little bit about your group please love to hear it yeah on the back of what i call the unlimited worth project so i just you know, the big thing for me was I felt worthless and I felt limited in my life because of these subconscious things that were going on. Right. Uh, so I, I felt at the other side of my journey of treatment and therapy that I was unlimited and, um, I understood my worth at that point and to take that further. So, you know, we talked about a podcast and I, I do have the book and part of the biggest revelation I had in this is, um, I could have really dealt with this at age 30, 20, (laughs) 40, (laughs) you know, any other time other than the crisis where I decided that suicide was on the table. Like I could, that could have been done. However, I had never at any point, number one, didn't understand how profoundly connected trauma at a childhood or a developmental brain is to everything you do in life until you, you fix it, if you will. And I, I I use that word simply, but it's not that simple, but I'll use that okay. term until you fix it or resolve it. It's going to be and it's wired in there and it's not going to unwire until you deal with it. Secondly, all the risks I ever perceived of sharing um, my secret about, about what was really, you know, part of my, fa- the fabric of who I was, um, all those risks were wrong. And mm-hmm. a simple comfortable environment. I was in business world. I was in a male dominated, typically patriarchal institutional culture where you don't talk about your feelings, except there's a guy over there doing Coke. There's a person abusing his wife. He's blowing up his, you know, like it's constant and obvious that people are having challenges yet. I was in a culture where suck it up, drive forward. You don't talk about this stuff, especially not at work and yep. you move on. Right. And, and among so many other things that we're told and bred into us, inbred into us in, as a man. And so I kept it quiet. And mm. what I learned is a simple conversation that allows a man to have the space to speak openly about the struggles that they have and give them the space to share removes the isolation begins to unwind that um, self-talk the things that we have going on in our brains we begin to have to make sense of them because now we have to explain them to others when we perceive that that risk is too great we just keep it all spinning around in our brains when we're able to process it and share with others who are accepting and it's in a comfortable safe environment we're then able to kind of work through this stuff and all you need is another person in the room saying you know my knee hurt so i saw my doctor right my 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 mind wasn't working so i saw a doctor or 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 a therapist and we solved it and mm. it took it would take that conversation and a man will go yeah you know maybe i'll try that out i mean shoot we try out you know, people are trying out ice baths. Um, they're trying out food, diet, like all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff to mm-hmm. try to make themselves well, doing mm-hmm. everything they can to avoid having a straight conversation about the things that really bother them with the person who can help. Like 
we do everything we can to avoid that moment. And all I want to say is I want to create space for men who are in leadership, who no one really cares on a day-to-day how they're feeling, right? The leaders of business, of industry, sport, entertainment, these mm-hmm. leaders at the top rung, right? They're the people below them. You know what they care about? They care about they, the decisions they make don't ruin their lives, <laughs> right? But the yes. leaders have no comfort, to, uh, no comfortable space to talk about the things that they're challenged with. And so they build buffers and they build perimeters. And what I hope is through Men Worth Meeting, which is this monthly men's group that I've got in person today, because I'm I've always been dying since the pandemic started to get people right in, in, in front of humans um, and an online group, North America wide that I'm launching in January of 2023. Okay. Right. So that's our, the beginning of 2023 is when men worth meeting starts um, awesome. online for anyone in North America. And I know we'll probably be a little bit later than that. It's all good. I didn't mean to timestamp this, uh, but at the same time, what we the whole premise is not go out into the forest and beat drums and you know get in touch with our hyper masculine side or you know find places where we can knit and be really like sensitive and talk about pressing flowers and hug and kiss you know like mm-hmm. i'm not an extreme fellow i'm a person dead set on bringing the mass the middle to a common ground and when we're talking about leaders our comfort is sitting around a table sitting around a boardroom table sitting around a dinner table, breaking bread, having conversations that are meaningful. You know, those conversations, Matt, between 10 at night and 2 a.m. You know, for some, it's over when the next bottle of wine goes and you're with a great group of people and it's just, you think that was a magical time. I wish I could put those people in a room. It's kind of self-indulgent, this men worth meeting. I just want to meet amazing men who can't have these conversations openly with anyone else. And it's not their to get people a support group, but we are there to support and provide a network. Um, it's not mm-hmm. a self-help group, but you're going to get self-help tool, <laughs> tools. Um, mm-hmm. So it's part mm-hmm. business group, part all of this. And really what it's about is just sharing ideas, discussions about current affairs, but it's about ideas and creating an opening that, you know, maybe sometimes what we do in life has some connection to something that we experienced in life that wasn't great. And if we can just crack that open just a little bit um, Mm -hmm. and do that regularly, it's probably the cheapest way, the most inexpensive way to prevent male mortality than anything out there. You know, Mm. male suicide is the eighth most common reason for death in North America. Wow. And the estimate is around 370,000 men are killing themselves more than women. It's a four to four to one ratio. It's four out of five suicides in 30 to 60 are, are men. And, and then you think of what are the other reasons people are, men are dying? Cardiovascular disease, heart disease, pulmonary, cardi, collier, pulmonary diseases, um, cancer, systemic diseases, right? And what are the key, some of the known factors that cause that? Depression, stress, anxiety, Mm -hmm. poor diet, poor nutrition, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Inactivity, poor sleep. Like all of a sudden you go, well, when I'm feeling mentally unwell, all of those things go by the wayside. Mm -hmm. And so now I've amped up my potential for getting a heart attack or cardiovascular disease or cancer. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to flip this entire system on its head, if we had strong mental health for men and one of the cheapest avenues is to have a conversation where men just share information with each other regularly a social group um doesn't that seem sublimely preferable to every other possibility you know um you know why why can't we just save men's lives that way and the profound effect that a good healthy male has on society um, in terms of their ability to pass on to the next generation and beyond, to change culture, to change institution, um, and then to get out of the way and enhance women's lives, right? Mm-hmm. You know, if we want real equity or equ- equality, um, we just need to be out of the way. But we can't be out of the way when we're so fearful, when we're acting with fear all the time and changing the institutions on everybody. So um, good, healthy, mentally well men uh, are really 
a key component to, you know, a good society. I mean, we're one of the biggest challenges on society. So why don't we fix that? Wow. Sorry. Mouthful. I know. I'm sorry. You, you just asked a question. That was amazing. That was deep. And you took us from place of isolation and great pain to healing childhood traumas and, and owning that, looking at the face and owning it. And as a male who is beset on all sides with the stigma attached in the business world to sharing feelings or to talking about um, sexual abuse or any kind of abuse or anything related to this is going to make me look like less than a man of what a man should be. I just uh, honor you for sharing the story. And I think one of the, the key points that helps us moving forward is a group of people that can support you, can listen to you, can share things with that maybe it's not easy to do it just on your own, keep it all bottled up inside. If I had a confidant or a group of people I could share this with and, and get it out, I mean, therapeutic aside, uh, there is something amazing about having your tribe, your, your crew of people that you can share with. Uh, I, I, I love everything you shared. I, I intentionally did not want to interrupt anything because it, it was all such wise, uh, wise advice. You know, so thank you for bringing <laughs> us to this point. Um, I wonder, I got, I got really wise just to inter, inter, interject, Matt. I yes. started to get wise when I realized I knew nothing. <laughs> so I hit an age in my life. I, I went, I know nothing. I'm just every day I'm learning so much more. And I guess maybe at that point you, you actually become, you have some wisdom to share. Maybe that's it. Maybe that is it. When you realize, and this, this is goes back to the, one of the very first things you said is having that self-awareness being aware enough to realize that you might not actually know all the stuff you think you know, be aware, open, transparent. And I would sprinkle in uh, the intangible secret ingredient, curiosity, you know, be curious as to what's possible next. And then what happens? Yeah. What happens is now someone who is successful on the verge of, you know, great things over here, but then had a couple of things that went wrong. And before you know it, it's thinking about suicide, right? Who yeah. then went and had the self-awareness to deal with it and has dealt with it and now is inspiring and leading groups of men to heal, to, to serve the world. Uh, I just got to thank you, brother. This is a, a fantastic redemption story. It's a great hero's journey you're sharing. And just, I love you for it, man. This is, this is, this is the good stuff. Uh, thank you uh, for sharing I, it. I really, I really appreciate that, Matt. Um, just imagine, you know, it just dawned on me. Imagine the humility that you gain when we talk about not knowing anything and maybe that's wisdom. I don't know. Uh, the humility that comes with thinking, realizing that for 40 years of your life, that the instincts that you relied on, the things that you believed that you could rely on, right? Those hardwired, you know, subconscious things that keep us moving forward in life that I actually couldn't rely on them because right. they were rewired or hardwired for me to save a, an 11 year old boy in the most primitive way, which would ultimately probably serve me extremely well. So in a, in a life or death, um, living on my own and, you know, protecting my cave and, you know, fighting off danger, I probably excel, right? Because that's how my brain has worked, protect the organism so it can pass on its code, you know? Uh, yeah. However, um, we live in a modern society that is urban and social and there's not a threat on your life every day and there's not someone going to take your stuff all the time you just perceive it right because we're wired that and so to think that for 40 years i relied on instincts that i thought because i the ones that were conscious i thought oh yeah I, my gut is right when really mm -hmm. my gut was completely right for what had happened but not right for the circumstance Yes. And so you gain emotional responses that cause you to act. And often I had to like, it was flee. It was flee or make a bad decision or, a, or align with someone that wasn't worth aligning. Like just there's so much. So you, you, you look back and you go, wow, well, I can move home forward with a lot of humility because I didn't realize I didn't have the control that mm. I thought I did. I didn't have the free will. And now on uncovering it, you start to go, well, okay, well, where else are the pieces that maybe I, I didn't see or can't see? And now how can I visualize those? And now that I know, how do I never do that? 
And so moving mm. forward with this great humility and awareness, um, you know, I think it, diff- it more, more, more definitely changes you. Um, and maybe, you know, when you asked, you know, people will say that Mike was, like, Mike was great as an advisor or as my coach or whatever, like he'll have, but they, and they were able to share with me things that they may never have shared, but there was always a limit. And this doesn't exist any longer. And, and it was my limit. It wasn't them. Like I, I most people don't want to share their stuff. And that's cool. But because I wouldn't, there was no way I would part with whatever 5% or 3% or 1% of whatever was my secret because I wasn't mm-hmm. out there openly. Uh, no one else could get in. And so mm. I'm passionate to always like banging off our matter. Uh, like our stuff was always colliding at some level. And now there's just, it's all about interacting in the space in between. And for me, that is, you know, I think that that's the biggest difference is where my shoulders go down and the com- conversation is comfortable. And, um, you know, we can immediately connect and we may never even speak again. You know, we might bond and create a great friendship where we talk every day or every week for the next few years, or we may never speak again, but this, this point in time was important. And you and I are now connected at this level, at least for this time you know, if not for forever. Amazing. Thank you for framing it that way. It makes me feel connected. It makes me feel part of uh, your community or our community as, you know, what I would term strong men who have dealt and overcome their own traumas who want to serve. It it makes me wonder uh, in this process of humility and self-awareness, Mike, what else might you have uncovered? You went in to solve this trauma. Uh, Were there other things that you learned, other hard wirings that you have since uh, changed or evolved as a result of this, um, this radical self-awareness and study? Oh, there's a big list. (laughs) (laughs) However, however, if I was going to pinpoint another one that for me, I think is, was really key is I always found myself, um, you know, in, as like, I preferred the vice president to the president of students council, right? I'd like to stand up beside the person in the limelight. Um, I always enjoyed the limelight to a point. I would always surround myself with people that got me raised up to a level to only so much. Um, I would, you know, pursue the opportunity to be right front and center, but then, you know, have an out. So I always avoided, you know, being, and people will say, no, you didn't. It felt like you're always wanted the spotlight, but that's not true. It was somehow, if we look back, I, there was everything but being center stage. And, and I think that that is the thing that's shifted the most, um, I, I being, and it wasn't playing small, but it was avoiding big because yeah. I never intended at any moment in my life to play small. Right. And I always thought I was trying to pursue big, but I never really did. And one of the reasons was if I did, then of course, subconsciously, I must've thought, well, I'll be found out. And I will be revealed to be the weak child who was taken advantage of, like all of that stuff, right? And now, I guess being aware of that, having been aware of that for the last year, is I'm I'm out and I'm out there. And quite frankly, that's where I should be. I should have always been, and and that is front and center in the spotlight, having the glare. And I say this all the time: is I'm doing that and doing this. So mm-hmm. that other men don't have to, like, you don't have to be in the spotlight to mm-hmm. come clean with who you are and the secrets of trauma that you have in your life. You can do that privately. Um, I'll, I'll take the heat. I'll step into the light. Mm-hmm. And for me, that's the place I need to be. I should have always been. And I knew that I always aspired to be there as a child. And now I'm just doing it. And so that's probably the other biggest thing is is because if I was, if I stood out, right, if I stood out, then I was abused. The reason I got abused is because I was the the best singer. I was the soloist. And that was the whole model of abuse that this person used. And so you Mm. were selected because you were good and, you know, and then you were, you know, nurtured in that and groomed. And so that was something I avoided all my life is to not be so stand out that, you know, I would be the confidant beside the best guy, the, the most successful person in the room, mm. right? Mm. And, and, you know, I would be the, the, the guy in the corner in the dark propping them up 
giving them information, being that share, but I wouldn't be the person spotlight was on. So, um, that's, that's changed that, you know, shine, shine all you want. Like that's where I want to be now because I've got a message that needs to be heard out there. Well, now that you've made this self-awareness, you made the discovery, you've done the work, you've uh, begun the process of healing and you're very transparent. Now that you have this, I wonder how has this impacted your business, uh, your family relationships? What's the impact now that you're on the other side of uh, starting to become aware and, and share? How is it impacting <laughs> your business and your and your family life? Well, I, I, I do joke. Um, you know, you can probably heal a lot quicker uh, uh, if, uh, and then, sorry, when you go into a mental health crisis, stuff is falling apart. Right. Yeah. And it's probably been falling apart for a while. And it clearly was for me. I couldn't, my business failed to get the kind of traction to create predictable, um, growth of any sort throughout the pandemic. Like until that moment, I just was reinventing myself all the time. I just couldn't figure it out. Right. And, and that's, that's an admission of, I, I don't know. I couldn't figure it out. It's fine. Um, but then once you're in that moment, it's like, everything was gone. I, I didn't work for four months through that process. You know, I, I did, I was not bringing in any household income. My wife and our kids stepped up, my family stepped up and they covered it. And that was important because I wouldn't have been able to heal if I was feeling the responsibility to focus on the income than I would to, on my brain, on my mind. Mm. And that was, you know, and I, that's part of what I'm doing with the new nonprofit is to help men who are doing that. So if you lose your house, your car, your family, it doesn't come back immediately. I didn't lose my house and car and family. I, I kept everything, <laughs> um, but it doesn't come back immediately. And 2022 started off really promising. And okay. then there, you know, then it kind of hit some stalling. And that was basically because the year prior, I just had nothing. I had nothing built. Like there was no substance to it. I was just good things started to happen because I had this new energy, but it wasn't it didn't have any staying power, right? It wasn't a business. It was just some good fortune here and there. And then for a few months in the summer, last summer, it was just all of a sudden gone again. And you're like, well, why? That's because my business wasn't really built. I didn't really take care of that. Um, I just was barely surviving. And now I've got to figure this out. And I committed to this movement, this unlimited worth project. And I went mm. all in on it. And here's what I know. I know that it's critically important that unlike any other business I've ever done, any initiative I've ever taken in my life, um, no other thing has gotten unsolicited daily connection and disclosure. People reach out to me constantly. I change lives. It's changing. I'm not saying me personally, but the whole effort that I'm taking, um, the res result is people's lives are changing and they're telling me. And so that, I just committed to it. I said, this is what I'm going to do. And, you know, getting anything new off the ground is tough, um, but you can't get financing when, you know, you've had the last year like I've had. So it's, it's, it was um, bootstrapping. And in the last few months, things have been back to what I would say a comfortable level, um, not as predictable, but yeah, better than they were in the last year. And, mm -hmm. and how that looks means, and basically it's, an increment of support for what you're doing with this project. Um, I just recently did three keynotes. Um, the book is out, you know, selling copies, hiring you for this. I, and now I want to work with you because I just saw what you're doing and, you know, I'd love you to coach me. All of that stuff has started to happen. And that's just the commitment of a business. So how are things going? Things are going fantastic. Um, can they go better? Yeah, I want them to be 10 times better, right? But as at where we are today, from where I was a year ago, and even when I decided that this is just going to be my thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 leaps and bounds, and and that gives me great comfort, satisfaction, and it reminds me that this is probably the most important thing in my life to date that I'll do. Uh, there was no business endeavor, no idea, no coaching thing I ever did, no nothing I've ever done with the kind of importance that this has that just happened. This is evolving and people are being involved and involving themselves um, unsolicited. 
And you know that when that's happening, I always wondered how that happened. <laughs> I always wondered I, in life, I was like, how do those guys and those women, how do they build businesses where everybody just jumps in and, you know, jumps on board and starts helping and throws in? First of all, the first few years, no one was doing that because <laughs> they did it alone. <laughs> but yes. then people said, you know, they're great. I really bl- believe in this. And I love how vulnerable and honest they are about where they are. I'm in. And now I've been feeling it and I've been enjoying that, uh, for the last few years, a year, last few months in particular, but the last year. And that's when, you know, you're probably doing something that will have, you know, some incredible, you know, there'll be a great reward at some point for me in this. Um, but the reward is that every moment this changes other people's lives and, you know, when that, that's become the priority and, and so the rest you know, you have to believe that it will tr- take care of itself. And I just never had the courage um, or trust that I'd be okay until I went through all this. And now, you know, I'll be fine. Uh, and sometimes mm. I don't know how, but it's it's going to work out. It all work. It's all working out, and it will continue to do so. So, um, yeah, it's pretty pretty awesome. Phenomenal. Uh, every moment can change people's lives. I- can you share, um, w- without using any names, of course, can you share an example of someone that's reached out to you or that shared uh, something that was heavy on them for a long time and they had the courage to to deal with it and, and own up to it and talk about it and work on it uh, and how that made you feel that you were helping someone and having that impact? Can you share a story of something like that? Um, I, I'm going to defer to maybe a little more general. I, I, I'd say that, I, there's been a dozen instances in the last 30 days where people said, I've never told anybody, but this, Mm. uh, about this, but you, sorry. Yes. And, and then it was what you said about X, um, you know, has, I'm going to go see help. I'm going to help my brother, my son, my husband, my ex-husband, um, you know, this man I know down the street, I'm going to help them find help. This is ladies. And from the men, it was, you know, I never told anyone this and it's been bugging me for years. And I just went and saw your guy. (laughs) Um, and thank you so much. You, you know, it's just changed my entire life. Um, I'll leave you like a little story. I was, I, I had the luxury of doing, like I said, I did a few keynotes last week and one of them was to 16 year olds, 200 in person, I, I, I didn't think that would be my first large, odd, larger audience. Like I, I've been speaking to five or 10 people and a lot of virtual, but the first one post pandemic for me was 200 ele- grade 11s. Wow. And we talked about mental health, mental wellness. Uh, we, I covered a little bit of my story. It was more about some personal, gr- my other growing up story about my father having mental illness. And that's a totally different podcast. Um, it's all good. Uh, and we had a great l- life. And a, a young lady came up to me afterwards. And, she, you know, she's a, a bit mousy in, you know, she's just creeping up. But she really was determined to come and talk to me afterwards. And she's got her headphones on, and which I still don't understand. I'm an old man now. I don't care. <laughs> it's, it's okay to have your headphones on and have a conversation. Apparently, that's cool. Uh, but I'm, I'm fine with that. And, you know, she leaned in and in a quiet voice, she goes, I really appreciate how you didn't use the word, how you didn't say the word. I was talking about my contemplation of uh, suicide. But I, I used um, ending my life. I used, uh, at one point I did say, I, I couldn't believe I was thinking about killing myself. Um, but I didn't use the word suicide. And, you know, for her, that meant everything. And, she, and when, then we had a further conversation. She discussed, you know, her journey um, as a young girl. And, and how important that what we just did at that presentation um, was for her. Um, and uh, how she looks forward to the next day now because someone else has uh, explained that it's okay and it's, it's, it's going to be okay. And it's in fact way better that you decide not to, um, no matter how dark you think it is. And so for me, that, um, you know, holds a lot of water. And I, I look at that audience and, you know, the stats are pretty heavy. I mean, one out of six young men 
uh, before age 18 will have some kind of sexual abuse. Um, roughly two out of five boys will have some form of abusive trauma in their lives before they're men. And the women's statistics are just as heavy. I think the men's are underweighted because we don't talk and we might kill ourselves at a far higher rate. So I think those stats are probably light. So if I'm sitting there looking at an audience of 200 16-year-olds, the statistical probability of at least 80 of them having gone through something that someone would consider rather unbearable at that point in their life or unspeakable um, is pretty high. And that gravity for me is one of the things that hit me. You know, you don't know how you're going to relate. Like I didn't, I, I've gotten all my tears out about my own. I'm, I'm not have emotional connection about my own circumstance. I do when it comes to family because my kids and my family's love is just overwhelming. Um, and I do when I see people in an audience or across the phone or across the table from me who connect. In other words, yeah, that's my story. I just haven't talked about it yet. Um, but what hit me was the gravity of the stats and just knowing that in that crowd of teens that a, a few dozen of them, not a, one dozen, ha, chances are two or three or four dozen of them had gone through something at this point in their lives that was something that might just have changed them for their lives to come and that they won't ever talk about or may never talk about. Yeah. And if that opportunity that I just took to get that conversation going um, kickstarts it, then um, it's it's pretty amazing because no one ever talked to me about that. Yeah. Yeah, me either. And I uh, I honor you and appreciate you for, for sharing your journey here and for sharing it in front of 16, pardon me, 216-year-olds. And you're triggering <laughs> something inside of me here because I've spoken in front of groups, thousands of adults. But man, put it in Damn. front of kids. I, I tell you, Mike, I did not I'll feel take, as I'll much. I'll take a 10,000 adult audience over 200 teens. They're, yes. They're yeah. a hard audience, man. Well, how about this? Um, you've got kids. I, I, I coach some soccer teams. I don't feel any anxiety or stress about picking up the phone and making a cold call or making a call to, to for, for a business prospect. <laughs> but you put me in front of Literally eight six year old girls, and I'm coaching their team, oh, and man. I've got they're, like eight moms over there watching me. That right there was real pressure. <laughs> that was real. Dude, you're telling me. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I so feel for you, you know. And where else but at home with teenage kids? Where you, where you, are you? Just you could you could accomplish anything. It'd be like Obama or whoever you know goes home, and then they just get. You know, their kids are like, <laughs> "You're wearing that," <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or "Dad, don't be such a dork." And, you know, you might be leader of the free world, uh, but it doesn't matter at home, you know, so, and teens are so blatantly, the younger kids are even more blatantly honest, but your teens to you as a parent are blatantly honest and it's emotional and it's hormonally driven. And, you know, it comes with some passion. Like if they're disappointed, you know it, you know, or whatever. So I don't know. It's mm. pretty fun. If I were to say the word, um, say toxic masculinity what does that mean to you and how might we take a step towards solving that challenge so i did mention i'm a fairly middle ground person um mm -hmm. common common ground is where i like to find um, everybody's instinct or their conversation as i i'll happily walk into the extremes and listen um, I'm not offended. Uh, and when I consider the the phrase toxic masculinity, it's something that, you know, kind of puts me off. And, and here's why. I do say, of course, that there are opportunities where masculine masculinity is a toxic thing. It creates a toxic environment. But the premise that somehow a male culture has simply created a toxic environment for the world is, is, is really incorrect. Mm -hmm. Um, there are instances and there are cultural institutionalized structures that we have put in place as men and the men before us helped do that as well, that create situations for that to rise 
and be amplified and be oppressive to others. Um, but it's not inherent in being a man that we're mm. toxic. Um, it is inherent in some of our cultural institutional structures, and it's inherent in our lack of ability to speak openly and honestly about our feelings. Mm. And when constricted in that way, which is a natural thing that's going on for every man, um, there's no excuses. It is just what it, it's our environment and we can change it. Um, but when in that position, you get men and young men who will get isolated and they become a problem. And the problem mm. is, is they have no socialization skills. They have no comfort or trust that they'll be okay in a social setting. And they revert into their mind and into a world that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. And you combine that with a negative environment for men to be in, and you've got a a recipe for challenges for sure. Mm -hmm. And where I feel that we can, we can make a big impact. And I do spend a lot of time, not just with kids, but with leaders and in leadership, we have an opera time opportunity. And I kind of visualize it as elbowing, elbowing out the walls of this patriarchal BS that we mm -hmm. put in place that somehow that we're rewarded for dominance over others that if we don't get someone will get ours that women and sex and money and stuff and material goods are the only thing worth pursuing and if you talk about your feelings that you're less than none of that has a place in our world today and we have the ability to to shift that and if we do as men we can be masculine Mm. And we can be well, and mm -hmm. we can be part of the solution. Um, and, and so I don't think toxic and masculinity, I think that we were always, you get this label that it's somehow bad to be a man and it's not, mm -hmm. um, it's bad to be a bad man. And the question is, how'd you get there? And did you get there because you have some serious trauma that we never helped you to, you know, deal with? So it's up to us who mm -hmm. are healed, who have resolved, or maybe have never experienced trauma to pitch in mm -hmm. and come to each other's aid and say, man, there's an opportunity for you to discuss this. And there are ways that maybe you can get better. Um, on the extremes, there are extremes in all cases. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't heal everybody. But the, the bulk of the people who create the culture we live in, we can we can do a lot and we should do a lot. Uh, completely agree. And I appreciate you talking, uh, speaking openly, honestly, uh, and allowing ourselves to feel and to share that and to work on our stuff rather than bottle it up inside. And I appreciate that you kind of delineated that, uh, you know, toxic and masculinity don't even belong in the same sentence. It's like a created manufactured concept that some people may have uh, this way about them. I, I'm, I'm with you on the way you described that. That was well done. Uh, yeah, ding, ding, ding. You. Mike, I'd, I'd love to, uh, <laughs> I just I just got the, uh, the ding, ding, ding here. I think it's time for the lightning round here to start to move towards wrap up. Uh, and by the way, awesome. you've been a, a great guest because you've taken some very, potentially what many would say a heavy subject matter and you brought such a human element to it and I honor you for that. Yeah. Uh, and the way that I would, of course, try to make it light when someone could be in a really heavy spot right now hearing this, uh, you know, I would invite the lightning round. So I'm going to ask you some fun questions, hopefully fun questions. Awesome. Uh, That's great. And then at the end, I'll ask you how uh, our listeners can find out more about you and your books and your group. And uh, before we get to that, though, I'd love to ask you, this is the Eternal Optimist podcast. So when I say Eternal Optimist, what does that mean to you, Eternal Optimism? It's pr pretty simple. Um, I wake up every day uh, willing to go down the dark tunnel to see whether the light at the end is the sun or a train. And it doesn't matter to me. It's the adventure of life that gets me through that. And, you know, I think that that just epitomizes it. It's, you know, it's the event. The, life is an adventure. We're fortunate to be here uh, at right now, at this moment in time, in this point in history to be able to look forward and see what's uh, around the corner. And I, you know, and that, and you talked about curiosity. That's, you know, you have to be curious about 
and you have to embrace that even if it's not the best result on the other side, it's worth getting there. Mm. I love your answer. I hear a lot of gratitude in your your answer. Is that like a, a core pillar value of yours? Because I've heard this several times. Is this this gratitude to be here? This fortunate. Uh, does that what does that word or that idea of gratitude mean to you? It's. I just marvel at the fact that we're here. You know, having mm. just the, the the possibility of that that we couldn't be here. That we're here for such a finite point in time that we have the whatever consciousness is for us we have it and Mm. even if it's an illusion we're living it and we get to embrace that for the time that we're cognizant we can enjoy it and so why not there's so many cool things out there that that remain to be found or seen or learned like you're not gonna live i'm not gonna I don't know. I'm not going to step foot in certain parts of this world or have certain conversations, but boy, I can still read and learn and enjoy them and ingest them and, you know, have my own. And so, you know, I just, I'm just grateful for those opportunities. Awesome. Awesome. I'd love curious if there is a uh, favorite movie or song that you've drawn some inspiration from over time. Uh, what might that movie and or song be for you, Mike? Oh my gosh. These are, these are my most challenging things. Um, <laughs> I know everybody wants to talk about all kinds of different things in their lives, but you know, I happen to have one of my favorite movies and it always comes up. I have a long list of favorite movies, but almost famous is one of those movies that always comes up for me. Hmm. And it, I don't know if it comes up, it's at the left out, out left field. It's not the best picture that ever was created, but there's some moments in it that are just truly, um, they bring back to the spirit of the adventure of life and that um, sometimes life doesn't go as planned. Um, But, you know, if you have a hopeful group who really are genuinely there for the love and the joy and the happiness and to find some sense of calm somewhere, um, you know, that there's that moment after they go on tour and they have this big blowout and, you know, Elton John's tiny dancers playing in this, they're in their tour bus. And that is one of those moments in a movie that for me, may not for anybody else on the planet, but for me, I thought that was one of the most poignant moments I'd ever watched in a movie. And I don't, you know, there's, and it doesn't seem like that profound a, a thing, but it just, it touches me in that way that where you get that alignment of the right music, the right emotion, yeah, and at that point at the movie, there was the right relief um, that somehow, regardless of whatever happened in the future, it, it just everybody would be okay in their own way. And so for me, that I don't know. That's yeah. That's a that's a thing. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. You said that you're, you're, you're people are going to go. I never thought that. I never heard that from you, Mike. <laughs> well, you, you just brought no, up a feeling. You, you, I, I really just felt this uh, this wave of emotion come over me because I'm thinking about uh, a movie that inspired me in the same way. Uh, and that'd be Days of Confused. The very last scene, Matthew oh. McConaughey, they're in the car getting ready to go get the tickets. And, you know, the song is playing. Uh, and everyone's just so awesome. smiling. I don't think it's because they're stoned. Maybe because they're stoned. But more because they're just with their <laughs> community. They feel they feel good. And, and they're on that journey. So I, I appreciate your answer. Almost famous. Yeah. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on the queue. Maybe watch that this weekend. I've never yeah. seen it. So thank you. Oh um, yeah, you got it. You got it. It's it's like uh, it's really cool. If uh, uh, some great great performances too. Good, good. Last question here around this subject might be: uh, if there is a book uh, that's had an impact on you, or a book that's on your nightstand right now, uh, you know, what is that book that has impacted you, Mike? Hmm. I I almost want to turn around. Uh, you know, it kind of comes and goes. Um, the book that when I was at my darkest and reached out to a, f- a good friend and she's in the business of love tough, <laughs> at least when it comes to our relationship, mm-hmm. um, she said, before we talk tomorrow, cause we just texted, she goes, get the four agreements and read it. And, and I, I said, Oh, I know I have it cause I've read it and I haven't, it's around here somewhere. So I just dug it up and you know, the that is in its simplest form one of the best books i've read um and i've read tons um 
you know, be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions, you know, and always do your best. I mean, my gosh, like if that's not just a good set of core values that you mm. stand for, uh, you know, um, but that's, I mean, it's, it was just, it's in its simplicity. It's just so good. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Mike, it's been a blast. Uh, how can our listeners find out more about your group, your books, just anything about you? Uh, help us uh, find out more. Please share your, your list of places that we can find more. So if you're listening and you're an event planner, put me on your stage. I'll help you. I'll, you know, a thousand people will then learn. <laughs> it's all about, uh, I want a million men and the people who love them to know this story in the next year. So whatever way we can spread the word. Mm -hmm. uh, but where you can find me. So I'm I, my biggest online social media presence really is LinkedIn. Uh, I prefer that platform. Uh, it's where I'll blog more frequently, almost daily, um, and share. Uh, the other place you find me is mikescriptnick.com, and you just forward slash unlimited worth project, unlimited worth book, unlimited worth podcast. All of them are right there. Um, my book itself, Unlimited Worth, uh, can be bought on Amazon.com, .ca, .australia, wherever you you happen to be listening to this. Mm. So that's awesome. where you'll find me. And uh, Men Worth Meeting, you know, kicks off in the new in 2023, and you know, um, it's on my website too, MikeScripnick.com forward slash Men Worth Meeting learn more, sign up, join us once a month for a group session and once a month for a guest speaker, a man worth meeting. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so much, brother. Appreciate you coming on today, Mike. Uh, just gratitude and appreciation for you uh, and in your journey for sharing it and uh, uh, wish you the best. And thank you. Matt, thank you so much for having me. I, I, you know, I love that you are here espousing optimism through stories of people and you know what they may have overcome and what they have to share um, i really appreciate you and what you do 